Hey, everybody, I hope you're doing well and your New Year's off to a great start. Um, we have another covenant that we're going to learn today, and it's one that you're probably familiar with. Um, if you were with us uh, in the journey, we've gone through uh, this study of Abram before, and so it might be something that you guys are, are, uh, are already used to hearing about, but um, you're going to get a better understanding of it as we've been going through this study of, of what covenants are. We're trying to understand you know, what they are, why they were made, how they were made, and then what some of the customs uh, were used to make them uh, of the past. And so when we speak about customs, I want to go over the, the letters that you guys learned in week one and, and that fun saying that we had uh, created to help you understand them and to remember them a little bit better. So if you remember back on week one, we learned uh, P-T-C-B-S-M-E-N which stands for Parents Teach Children Bible Stories Morning, Evening, Night. Um, but again, that phrase is to help you understand the different customs, those eight customs that you need to remember, that there was a promise, time, conditions, blood sacrifice, sign, meal exchange, and name change. And so we saw that in previous um, weeks, but now we're going to study Abram, and we're going to look at how all of that applied to him. Uh, all the way back in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, um, we see uh, Abram and we get introduced to him. At the very end of chapter 8, we learn about who Abram is and we know that he was called by God uh, to leave his homeland, his country, and take some of his family with him and go to this place where God says, I will show you what to do, this land that I that I've made for you. And so if we get started and we look at what Abram was doing in Genesis chapter chapter 12, one day he's just sitting there and all of a sudden it says that God um, uh, comes to him and says to him, I am going to make you some really big promises. I'm going to make some really big promises to you and you're going to understand um, exactly why I brought you here and what I want to do with you. And so God doesn't tell him before he leaves what he wants to do. He just says, I need you to get up and go. But then once he's there, finally one, at, at, some, at this one point, he tells him exactly what he wants to do. He takes him to this land of Canaan. He's living there. And uh, what, what God um, tells him at this moment is that he is going to make him a, uh, a great nation. He says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you uh, this, this descendant, uh, the, these long list of descendants. This, this nation is going to come from you. And you guys are going to um, learn a little bit about that in a minute. But God really makes these incredible promises. But you have to remember, he doesn't just immediately say these things. I mean, there's some time that passes before all of these promises come true, but even before God really starts to reveal this to him in a way that we can understand. So God first makes this promise to him in Genesis chapter 12. And then a long time later, God comes back to him and actually institutes this, uh, this promise. He, he gives him this promise. And we see that in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, he first tells Abram, do not be afraid because I, God, am your shield and your great reward. So God makes this promise to him and tells him, don't be afraid. Everything that I, I have planned for you, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to ensure that you are protected and you're cared for as this happens. But again, all of this is happening because God is on his side, that, uh, um, that, that God is for Abram, that God is uh, caring for Abram. There's nothing that Abram had done in this point in his life to be uh, given this privilege to be given this reward. God had just chosen him and, and decided that he was going to be somebody that he was going to use um, to make incredible things happen. Now, uh, a little bit later in, uh, in chapter 15, he says this to him. He says, look towards the heavens and count the stars. If you are even able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Genesis 15, 5. Now, you need to know at this point, <clears throat> Abram didn't have any children. He had a wife named Sarai, but she was barren. She could not have children. And Abram was pretty old at this time. He was around 90 years old. So he didn't know anything about having children, and he did not think that he was ever going to have these descendants. Now, a side note for what descendants means, that just means you're going to have a lot of grandkids and great-grandkids. Like, you're going to have a really long line of people. Think about your own life. You've got parents who have grandparents or uh, you have parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents. And that's essentially what God was telling Abram. Even though you don't have a child right now, I promise you, one day you are going to have many descendants. And he even says they're going to be so numerous, you want to be able to count them. And so all these promises that God is making with Abram, they're awesome for sure. They're incredible. But Abram is human. 
and he can't see into the future. And honestly, he's needing some reassurance from God. He's needing God to know, um, or he's needing to hear from God and to know from God that this is going to happen. And so Abram basically asked God this question. How do I know that you are going to keep your word, God? That's a great question to ask because we don't always know if things are going to happen the way that we hope that they're going to happen or the way that we want them to happen. And so he's really asking this question, how do I know these things are going to happen? Because he needs God to show him that he can be trusted. Abram needs God to reveal this to him and to to show him how this is going to happen, but to to be faithful to this promise of what's going to take place. And so that's really what gets us into this covenant. This is why God makes this covenant with him. And it is this illegally binding agreement that God makes with Abram. There's no way God can break it. There is a way that that Abram can break it because he's he's human, he's fallible, he's going to make mistakes. We even see him making some mistakes a little bit later. But God cannot break this promise. And so God now is going to institute this covenant, and he's going to do it by a ceremony. And so now if we go back again to this promise, we see that happening. There's going to be a time. There are certain conditions. Um, We're going to see a blood sacrifice and a sign and a meal, an exchange or a name change. All of this is going to happen. So if we go back and we remember those letters, here's what we start to see happening. This covenant ceremony is going to start taking place. And uh, one thing to note is that anytime you you cross, you, you come across a custom in this in, in a story, um, you're, you're going to see some, some things that are going to happen uh, in the midst of this. And so this is what God says to him. Um, when there's this covenant, he's going to do something that we may not truly understand because our culture and our custom doesn't do it this way, but God still has a specific plan. So he says this in verse 9 of chapter 15. says, So um, the Lord said to him, Abram, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Now what happens really next is interesting, and I want you to notice that God doesn't tell Abraham what to do with the animals. He just says, this is what I need you to bring to me. And then, a little bit later, in the very next verse, it says, Abram brought all of these things to him. And then finally, God tells him what he needs to do. It says, cut them in two, cut them in half, and arrange the halves on opposite sides of each other. The birds, however, will not be cut in half. So he tells Abraham, Abram that you need to take a heifer, which is a cow, a goat, and a ram, and cut them in half, and lay one half of each of those animals on one side, and the other half you lay on the other side. So there's almost this pathway that is right between them. But don't cut the pigeons up. Don't cut up the, an- the birds just yet. So right now we see the definition of this covenant in the in the. Uh, in the ancient Hebrew, in the original Hebrew, starts to tell us what this needs. Covenant in Hebrew actually means a a compact, an agreement that's made by passing between two pieces of flesh. So when you think about um, some of the covenants that we have today, uh, one being, for instance, a a marriage, um, I wear this wedding band on my finger to show people that I have made a covenant with my wife. And so this is very similar in the old Hebrew Uh, way that this process, this passing through between pieces of flesh, uh, essentially symbolizes this covenant. So Abraham had cut these animals up, he laid them in half, and he was doing something very important um, as a part of this ceremony by walking in between them, by passing between these pieces of flesh. And so there's some, you know, it may sound really weird and it may be kind of um, scary that this stuff is happening, you know, hacking up animals and setting them on either side. But then it says a little bit later that this dark, uh, great darkness fell upon uh, Abraham, Abram as he was getting ready to do this. And so, um, you know, he's cut these animals. I'm sure he's exhausted because it probably takes a lot of time to cut up three big animals like that. Um, But it says that this great darkness fell upon him. And then a little bit later in verses 17 and 18, this is what we see. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made the covenant with Abram. Now, We've talked a lot up to this point uh, uh, about you know certain English words that don't really give us a, a good picture of what's really happening. Um, we call them treasure words, which means that if you dig a little bit deeper into these words that were in the original language, 
that something really cool is going to be um, taking place. And so here's the first one. It says, we read that God made a covenant with Abram. That word made. That Hebrew word is karath or kurath, and it actually means cut. So God actually cut a covenant with him. Uh, but it is, uh, um, it's essentially symbolizing this blood sacrifice that took place. So he cut a covenant, meaning there was a blood sacrifice that was used to make this covenant between them. So we can't forget these, these, um, you know, these things that were taking place, God had instituted and God wanted them to do for a specific reason. But we can't forget that these were promises. Um, uh, what were the other promises? Excuse me. What were the other promises that were made as part of the Abrahamic covenant? We see first that um, God says that I'm with you and I'm going to protect you. But he says, I'm going to give you a land and I'm going to give you a great nation. So all of these descendants are going to come from him, but he's also going to be given this land of Canaan. And so the best part about all of this is that this covenant that God makes, this um, the ceremony that is created, you don't see Abraham or Abram going through those. You just see a, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch go in between them, which symbolizes God passing through as part of that covenant, and then God, rep, another piece representing Abram, Abram walking through it, because only God can keep this promise. Abram, Abram cannot keep this promise. Instead, God has to do that for him. This is an unconditional covenant, meaning cannot be broken. Because God is the one who instituted it. God is the one who created it. And God's the one who's going to make sure this takes place. There's nothing Abram can do to make it right. There's nothing he can do to, to make it um, go away, to make it stop. This is an unconditional co covenant. And so there's a few more customs that I want you to see. In Genesis chapter 17, we start seeing a little bit more of this. Now, this is when God comes back and starts to tell him a little bit more about this covenant and what's going to take place. There have been several years that had elapsed between this ceremony that had been established in chapter 15 and then in chapter 17. So now Abram is 99 years old. His wife Sarai is 90 years old. And so there are some things that are starting to take place to solidify this covenant that is being, being made between God and Abram. We see three other customs taking place. First, the name change. In verse 5 of chapter 17, God says, you are no longer to be called Abram, which means exalted father. You are now going to be called Avraham, Abraham, which means exalted father of many. So at this point, Abram was an exalted father, but he wasn't even a father. Now he is the exalted father of many. So he says, now you're going to have um, all of this. In verse 15, God also changes the name of his wife Sarai to Sarah. And so we're seeing this name change taking place because God is now continuing to institute this covenant to show them that there is a change, not just with um, within them, but what's going to happen from them. There's also a time change that takes place. In verse 7, God promises Abram the land of Canaan. It's going to be an everlasting uh, covenant, an everlasting possession. It means that they will always be able to, to, uh, to inherit it. They will always be able to, to um, have the land. It will always be Abram's, Abraham's land. He will always possess that land. So we see this time period being forever, eternal. But then lastly, we see the sign. In verse 9, God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generation. So it's not just a covenant between Abraham and God. It's between all of Abraham's descendants and God. And the question is, how were they to keep it? Well, it says in verse 10 of chapter 17, Every male among you shall be circumcised. Now, if you don't know what circumcision means, then that's a question you need to go ask your mom and dad, and they're going to help you with that because they'll be able to explain it a lot better than I can. But the bottom line is this circumcision was a visible mark on the body of every male that was a reminder of this, the um, covenant between Abraham, their father or forefather, and God. 
So it was like a, a, a almost like a, a, a visible mark on their body that every time they saw it, it was a reminder that they belong to God and everybody who comes after them, they belong to God and they are part of this promise. And so that's a really serious covenant that not only do you walk through these pieces of dead flesh, these dead animals, and you have this ceremony and your name is changed, you now are going to bear a physical mark that separates you from everybody else on the earth to remind you that you belong to God, that you are part of this promise that God had given the forefather Abraham. So what's what's the point in all of this? I got some questions I just want you to think about. Has anyone ever felt the way Abraham did? How can I be sure that God is going to keep his word? How can I be sure that you, God, are going to keep your word? We've probably all felt that way, right? We've all wondered, how is it that we can know God will keep all of the promises that we read about in the Bible? Have you ever doubted some of the things that you've read in the Bible or maybe had a hard time believing that God was even real? I mean, these are okay things to to think about. You know, have you ever wondered about God keeping some of these promises? These aren't bad things to think about. These are things that we should think about because we're human and we need to to think through them. We need to try to understand them. But then we need to go back to what is real, what we can understand. And I just want you to think about this. We're talking about this story of Abraham thousands of years after it happened. We're still talking about it. That should tell you that people who came after Abraham and came before us, they believed in that promise so much that they wrote it down, they preserved it, they protected it, and they continued to pass it on to people who came after them. That should at least tell you that there is some, there are people who have believed this. They have had faith that God was going to be um, true to his promise and to his word. And so here's the thing, the last thing to remember. God used a covenant to show Abraham that he could trust him, and he does the same for us. And so those are great things to remember. Those are great things to understand. But I just want you to remember that God has been true to his promises. He is true to his promises, and he will be true to his promises in the future. So thank you for paying attention and listening. And let me just pray as we we close out today so that we can be reminded of of just how much God has done for us and how much he will do for us in the future. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. We thank you for this message. We thank you that we can see in the life of Abraham that he didn't do anything in his life to make you love him. You loved him no matter what, unconditionally. And that through his faith, he believed you were going to, to be true to your promises. And we too, Father, through our faith can can be rest, we can rest assured knowing that you are going to be faithful, that you are always going to carry out your promises, Lord. And so even when we may doubt in our minds and in our hearts, Lord, that you will give us the truth. You will give us the comfort of knowing that you are real and that you hear us and that you love us. And so, Lord, I just pray for our faith. I pray that, as your word says, the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains, that our, as little as our faith may be at times, if we have that faith and we, we hold on to that faith, that you will continue to be true to your promises. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody have a great week. Thank you so much for paying attention, and I hope everything goes well.